Open your Bibles tonight to the Old Testament. We're going to look at the book of Judges. So if you will turn in the scriptures to Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. One of the ministries that we're excited about here at Geneva Bible Church is our biblical counseling ministry. And one of the things that comes up Every counseling case, when someone comes with help or for help, is the need to focus on biblical confession and biblical repentance. What does that actually look like? This is a big problem in our society today, not just in secular society, but also among Christians. Uh, For example, when we confess to uh, someone or to one another, oftentimes we say something like, well, I'm sorry or I apologize. But if you take a step back and ask yourself, what does that actually mean, that someone is sorry? Does that mean you're sorry you got caught? Does that mean you're sorry about the consequences of your actions? A lot of times, even in politics, we hear politicians say, well, I'm sorry if you were offended at what I did. Is that true repentance? Is that true contrition? And we would say, no, that's not true repentance. There's no heartfelt sorrow or change, heart change based on that kind of confession. So from Judges 10 tonight, I would like to show you the nature of true repentance. And in this text, we'll see four steps to Israel's cycle of sin and repentance that we see over and over again in this text. And this is an important message for us because this is really the daily business of every Christian. Every day we sin, therefore every day we need to confess that to the Lord or to someone else and repent, resulting in a change of mind and change of action. Question is, is our repentance genuine or is it not genuine? So let's look at our text tonight. We'll just start with reading verse 6 of chapter 10 of Judges. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals, the Ashtaroth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord, Yahweh, and did not serve him. So this begins our first step in this cycle of sin and repentance, and this is Israel's apostasy, their apostasy. If we were to scan the first nine chapters of the book of Judges, we would see that this theme of Israel falling into sin or doing evil in the sight of the Lord occurs up until this point six times already. And so it's no wonder that as we look at verse 6, it says that Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. I remember growing up as a kid, just reading these stories after Israel had been delivered miraculously out of Egypt, and they see all the signs and all the wonders. And I asked myself, how in the world could they reject the Lord after they see all the signs and the miracles, the deliverance? But if you skip back to chapter 2 of Judges, I think we get a hint of why. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. In other words, they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord to serve the Baals. The common thread that we see here time and time and time again is that the word of the Lord was not passed on from one generation to the next generation. The word of God was neglected. This is a common theme in biblical counseling as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that this evening. Uh, For those of us that are involved in counseling, this is almost a universal principle that when you ask someone who is struggling with a sin issue, are you consistent in daily Bible reading where you are ingesting the Word of God prayerfully and with understanding, and almost universally the answer is no. No, I'm not. And so we see in our lives and in the life of Israel here that there is a direct correspondence between neglecting the Word of God, 
with disobedience. The most important part of your day, brothers and sisters and friends, is the time that you devote to Scripture and to prayer. So we say you don't try to find time, you, you make time because it's the high priority issue of the day. As I tell my kids often, it's like going into battle for the day. Do you, when do you put on your armor? After the battle's over or before? Well, you put your armor on before you enter the battle of the day. So in the morning is a great time, even if you have to get up early to read Scripture. That's what we do in our families, individually. That's why we open the Word of God here at Geneva Bible Church and read it. And we are responsible also, as we see here, to teach the next generation, our children, our grandchildren, the Word of God so that they do not fall into the same apostasy that we see Israel doing here. So as we return to verse 6, it seems that Israel's sin had reached a level of completeness. Now, why do I say that? How can I say that? Well, verse 6, if you read the text again, how many gods does Israel run after in the text? Verse 6, the number of gods is seven. And as you know, in Scripture, the number seven has a sense of completeness to it or perfection to it. So it is as if the author is telling us that Israel has fallen into complete, utter, total spiritual corruption. Their transgressions had reached the fullest measure, and God had had enough. So notice verses 7 through 9 for God's response. Verse 7, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he sold them, into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. They shattered and crushed the sons of Israel that year. For 18 years they were afflicted. All the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan and the Gilead and the land of the Amorites, the sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, Benjamin, the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. And so first we have seen their apostasy. Now we see our second point to this cycle, and it is oppression, their oppression. Once again, Israel falls into sin. Once again, God delivers them into their oppression by their enemies. And notice verse seven, it's very interesting. Who sells Israel into the hands of her enemies? Who's responsible? Verse seven says, it is God that he personally sells them into the hands of the Philistines and the Amorites. Now, hopefully you can kind of see the irony here, verse 6 and 7 and onward, that Israel worships the God of the Philistines and the Amorites, and now they are being enslaved by the people of the Philistines and the Amorites, the gods they chose. Israel betrays the true and living God, and then the gods that they chose instead are the ones that are enslaving them. What irony. Now, what are, are the Philistines? Where are the Amorites? Does that even matter? Well, if your Bible has maps in the back, we, sometimes we call it the last book of the Bible, the book of maps, you'll see where the Philistines and the Amorites are located. And I think this is very interesting because God has strategically placed Israel's enemies on both sides of her. The Philistines by the Mediterranean. And on the east, you have the Amorites. And so God is like this brilliant general who is bringing enemies from both sides like pincer-like movements to attack Israel so that she is completely surrounded. What's the result? Verse 9, Israel is greatly distressed, bound, restricted. This is a rather shocking display of God's sovereignty, His providence in even the hearts of pagans. God Himself sells his own beloved people, his heritage. God himself moves the hearts and minds of pagan kings to assemble their entire armies to attack at the same time against Israel. The result is they attack, they shatter, they crush, they discourage the people of Israel. So what happens when God does all of this? 
God had always provided a judge when Israel cried out for help. And so this is what we see in this cycle. We see apostasy. We see oppression. Our third point is a plea. A plea for divine aid on behalf of Israel. Notice verses 10 through 14. We'll see what Israel says, and then we'll see what God responds with. Verse 10. Then the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Verse 11. Yahweh said to the sons of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the sons of Ammon, the sons of the Philistines? When the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Moanites oppressed you, you cried out to me and I delivered you from their hands. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. Go, cry out to the gods that you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. So after Israel has committed apostasy to the fullest extent, the complete extent, God once again afflicts them. However, for the very first time in Judges, up until this point, Israel actually confesses sin. That's amazing. After all these chapters, all these times where they apostatize, the very first time that they actually confess their sin. In verse 10, they use this possessive pronoun. We, are, uh, we have apostatized against our God, our Elohim. They are recognizing their special relationship to God, to Yahweh. They've been directly violating His law. So perhaps there's some, there's some hope here. Perhaps God will once again move. It all sounds very good, doesn't it? It's very easy to say the words, but God's response is absolutely shocking. We haven't seen this before in the book of Judges. Verse 11, he begins to catalog all the times that he delivered them. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Again, this number of completeness. God has done it for them, but God concludes to say, my grace has run out for you. Verse 13, you abandoned me, so I will no longer deliver you. These are, brothers and sisters, friends, these are haunting words. This is literally a death sentence for Israel. They have no hope now. God had always rescued them up until this point, and no doubt this audience expected the same thing. God is going to come and help us once we pray to him. But no. God had heard this before, time and time and time again, and he knew it is not genuine repentance. And they were simply treating, many, treating God like many people do today. God is thought to be some cosmic genie. We can manipulate, we can domesticate. And you notice how we can become very, very spiritual when things get bad in our lives. We quickly run to God, and we want God to do what we want Him to do in the time that we want Him to do it, according to our criteria, our agenda, our timing. And then when He delivers us and gives us what we want, then it's kind of back to life as usual. But think about what Israel did. Verse 13, they made an exchange, didn't they? They made an exchange. They abandoned God, and then they exchanged that to serve other gods. In reality, that's what all sin is, it is, isn't it? It is abandoning God for something or someone that we think will give us more pleasure. It's the same message if you read Romans chapter 1. That, that unbelievers, they suppress the truth in what? In unrighteousness. But they don't just stop there. They exchange the truth for a lie, but they don't just stop there. They suppress the truth, they exchange it for a lie, and then what do they do? Because we are all born as worshipers in our spiritual DNA, you eventually worship that which you exchange God for. It's spiritual adultery. And so notice the sarcasm that God brings here, this holy sarcasm in verse 14. Go and cry out to the gods that you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your distress. 
God is mocking them. We see the similar concepts in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 26, where God says, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your dread comes. I think, whoa, this is serious. <laughs> this does not sound like the contemporary evangelicalism that we're all accustomed to with this self help God that is so popular today, that God is only a God of love. He would never judge anyone. He accepts you unconditionally. He is your cheerleader. He was just hoping and rooting for you to do what is right. He would never condemn you. You you really just exist to be happy according to this kind of God. In my hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, I remember years ago seeing this massive sign on the side of the freeway that says, or said, God is not mad at you no matter what. God is not mad at you no matter what. Is that biblical? Well, is God a God of love and mercy? Absolutely He is. But we must never forget that He is also a God of holiness and justice that hates sin. We see these two concepts coming together at the cross, don't we? The love of Christ, the love of God for the world by giving the Father giving His only begotten Son and punishing Him. Why? Because God is holy. He is just so that we can be forgiven. The love and holiness of God coming together at the cross. Contrary to the thought that God is not mad at you or anyone, anytime, Psalm 7 says something very different, doesn't it? Maybe these words have come to your mind that God is angry with the wicked every day. In our text, in Judges chapter 10, God is indeed angry. It is as if God is looking at the depths of their own heart to see that and to show that their genuine repentance does not exist. What are their true motives? And maybe this is exposing the practical nature of just these words that come so freely, I'm sorry, I apologize, forgive me, and then just kind of go on as if nothing had ever happened with no change. Israel had repeatedly used God to simply get them out of a bad situation, and then they just went on like nothing had ever happened. So I think this is a good time to maybe pause and to think, what are the nature of our prayers? Do we pray the same way? Does our repentance look the same way to God in our ordinary lives? Is this how we confess to one another, oh, I'm sorry? Again, what does that mean if there's nothing said beyond that, if there's no change of heart, which is the definition of repentance? It is a changing of path from one direction to the next direction. How are we praying? What are we praying for? Do we confess sin specifically? Do we praise God for His grace, His mercy, begging Him to help us to live holy lives, asking Him to hate, help us hate sin as He hates sin. Well, what does Israel respond with? How could they have responded? What would you do if you were representing Israel and you had to, to respond to God in, in a form of prayer? Well, Israel could have done what they have done in the past. You remember when Israel left Egypt and God told them, do not attack this enemy. I'm not with you. And they did it anyway. What happened to them? They were slaughtered. They could have done that. They didn't. They could have turned from God and mixed with their culture. They didn't do that. They could have conscripted another army, maybe Egypt or someone else, to come help them in their distress. But they didn't do that. Their answer is in verse 15 and 16. It's absolutely amazing. Let's look at it. This is the fourth point in this cycle of sin and repentance, genuine repentance. Verse 15, The sons of Israel said to Yahweh, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. Verse 16, So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served Yahweh and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Notice what Israel does here. The first thing that they do is confess sin. Notice they did not say, well, 
if I sinned, forgive me, or I sinned, but we wouldn't have done that if you wouldn't have put us in this land. We often do that, don't we? Well, forgive me if I hurt your feelings, or forgive me, but, and usually what comes after, but negates everything you said before, right? Because we're making excuses or we're blame shifting. But Israel didn't do that. Uh, they named it and claimed it. They, they said what they did. They confessed their sin. And they did that in the initial confession, didn't they? But that's where they stopped. The real proof, in English we say the proof in the pudding, the real proof is what you do afterwards. Do you evidence a change of heart which is shown by a change of action? Or does it just stop with words? Well, the second thing that they do, verse 16, they turn from their sin. Again, that's the nature of repentance. It is a turning. They turn from their sin by destroying their foreign gods. In counseling, this is what we call putting off sin, and then you put on righteous behavior. You replace sinful behavior with righteous. It's interesting, in their previous plea for divine aid, they didn't do that. It was just words, no actions. But here they do. Then the third thing that they do is what? What does verse 16 say? They served Yahweh. They worshipped Him. That is what they put on. They put off the pagan idols and they put on worshipping the true and living God according to the principles of Scripture. Again, replacing sinful behavior. This is the godly exchange method, is what we call it. That is the essence of repentance. In other words, we don't ever see God tell people, just stop doing that, or stop thinking that way. And you think, okay, I have to stop doing this, stop thinking this way, stop thinking this way, and what do you find yourself doing? You're reminding yourself to think this way while you're telling yourself not to think that way. So in God's wisdom, He says what we are to replace those thoughts and actions with. Notice Ephesians chapter 4, I'll just read the words to you. This describes this put-off, put-on principle. Paul says, In reference to your former manner of life, you are to lay aside, that is to put off, the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, that you would be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's where it begins, right? And to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So how does this work practically? We understand the theory, right? Well, just imagine if you find yourself being a critical person where you're kind of nitpicking every little thing that someone does, how do you put that off and replace it with something righteous? Well, you would replace criticism with, what do you think? Words of encouragement. Uh, something that would build up. That is how God would want you to replace criticism. What about thoughts that you might have of anger or bitterness or anxiety temptation, sadness, depression, all of these things that are in the mind initially, how does God want us to put those off? Does Scripture ever tell us how to think? Absolutely. We're going through the book of the Philippians right now in our Thursday night Bible studies, and we're closely getting to chapter 4, verse 8, which commands us how to think. By the way, again, this is not an option it is a command. God tells you what to think about. Philippians verse 4 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable, if anything is of excellence or worthy of praise, and here's the command, think on these things or meditate on these things. So that is what we replace bad or sinful thoughts with because God wants you to think in a way that glorifies Him and will bring joy to your life. Put off, put on. Years ago, I, we, Sharon and I were, I think it was, we were in Texas, we saw a, a show, it was kind of a social experiment on children. And these children were brought one by one into this room, it's a very large room, and in the corner of the room, there was toys, a table with toys. In this corner, there was maybe a window. And they brought the children to a table. And on that table was this huge bowl of ice cream. 
and it had different flavors. It had whipped cream. It had the sprinkles. It had a cherry on top. And the children were sat down in this chair in front of the ice cream. And they said, we don't want you to touch it. And if you keep your hands off of it for five minutes, and by the way, I'm going to leave the room, but if you don't touch it for five minutes when I come back, you can have a whole bowl of ice cream. And so the one doing the experiment left the room, and of course the cameras are in the room, right? Watching these kids to see what they do one by one. And one kid looks at the ice cream and just immediately picks up a spoon and just goes for it. Just bad parenting, right? <laughs> and the next kid comes in, same thing. He maybe waits for a few minutes, like a couple of minutes, and just like looks around, starts digging in. The next kid maybe waits four minutes. But there was a common characteristic among the children that waited the full five minutes. If you were to guess, based on what we've been talking about, what these children did to avoid the temptation of eating the ice cream, what would you guess that those children did as they were seated there looking at the ice cream, the temptation? What did they do? That's where it begins. It begins telling themselves something. Eating it now. And then what do they do? As they're sitting there, they get up from the chair and they go in the corner and start playing with toys. You see what they did? They are borrowing biblical principles, aren't they? Whether they know it or not, put off, put on principle, where they replace the temptation with something else. In their case, it was more pleasurable. But the principle is same in the life of Christianity. We, we escape from temptation not by just saying, stop looking, stop looking, uh, stop thinking, stop thinking, but we replace the behavior with something else, and that is the God-ordained method in how He created us to help us to avoid temptation. Put off sinful thoughts and actions and replace them with godly actions. So this is exactly what we see of the Israelites. This is exactly what they do. They put off worshiping the false god and they put on worshiping the one true God. And not only that, but they entrusted God with their future. This is a big part of true genuine faith is that despite what God may do next, even though you may not like it, that you entrust yourself to Him. Yes, I may not get what I want in my sinful flesh. I'm going to deny myself, go to the corner and replace it with something else. And God, I entrust you with fulfilling my desires in your way, in your timing. Notice verse 15, what did Israel say? They prayed with what expectation? That for sure they're going to be delivered? No, verse 15. Do to us whatever seems good to you. That is probably the most profound statement, I think, in this entire narrative, is this prayer of trust. God, no matter what, just do to us whatever seems good to you. Whatever pleases you, whatever glorifies you, do it. And then try to think of that in your own life. Could you honestly, with all sincerity, with all of your heart and soul, pray that same kind of prayer to God? God, it doesn't matter what I want, even though my desires, I hope, are godly desires, even if I don't get them. God, just do whatever pleases you, whatever seems good to you. That is the mark of genuine repentance. In the case of sin, and Israel's being punished here, this prayer of faith shows true repentance because it accepts the consequences of sin. Yes, I have done this. I deserve this. I accept the consequences, God, if you want to bring that to me. I trust you with these things. It's a, an amazing, mature prayer to confess your sin before God, to put off sinful actions, put on the new, accept the consequences, and trust in God's sovereign and perfect plan this isn't simply remorse or worldly sorrow. This is repentance of faith. This is a Christian model of repentance, I would say. But going back to verse 15, some people say, well, it seems like it's kind of a, a double-souled pray, prayer, maybe, because isn't there a contradiction here? On the one hand, Israel says, we have sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you. But on the other hand, they say what? Only Please deliver us this day. 
But personally, and I think according to Scripture, we can say that it is a biblical, insightful, theologically accurate prayer. On the first half of the prayer, as we've already seen, they are resting in God's sovereignty. They trust Him. And that, that moment is no longer just all about them. It is about honoring and glorifying the name of Yahweh in the nations. They denied their wishes, their desired, and I love the word just resting. They, they rested in God and His sovereignty. It's very applicable to us, this first part of the prayer is that we all struggle in various ways, don't we? I think John began the service today. Like We don't really know everything that's happening in each one's life. You could be struggling with many different things, from conflict with family, friends, children, grandchildren, difficult decisions about future plans, suffering physically, financial difficulty, many, many things. Amidst all these things that we face, we, we are, we're all brought back to this central prayer again. Can we say of God, regardless of our situation, do to us, God, whatever seems good to you. This is, this is my will, but God, do what is good to you. We can do that. Why? Not because we're resting upon some philosophical or theological argument, even though it is theological in nature, isn't it? We are resting in God's character. That is where we find peace and rest and a balm for all of our sorrows. It is the nature of God, that God is by nature loving and kind and gentle and merciful. Almost every Thursday night, don't we? We talk about Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together, not just some things, but all things together for the good of those that love God and are called according to whose purpose? Not to ours, but to his purpose. That is where our affections lie. That's what we are zealous for. That is what we are obsessed with. We, we are wanting to focus on God's glory and God's purpose in the world so that He is magnified upon the nations. May His will be done. Many of us in this room, we know the, the name John Piper. One of his most famous sayings he, he got from Jonathan Edwards it is this, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in Him. What does that mean? It, it means that regardless of your situation, as bad as it may get, if you're not getting what you want, even though it may be a good thing, if Despite being in that low place, if you can still find satisfaction in God and God alone, that is most glorifying to God because it shows Him your true treasure. It is He Himself. So after all I've said, was Israel's last statement wrong? Verse 15. They said, God, only please deliver us. Well, I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's an unsure prayer. I think that we can tell God our heart desires. God loves to hear from us. We are, after all, called His children if you're in the family of faith. But in the end, we can also pray, Father, Your will be done. And who is our greatest example of this kind of prayer? Jesus Christ Himself, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, He said, Father, if You are willing, remove this cup from Me, but yet not... My will be done, but yours be done. Israel's prayer is similar in their distress, in their struggle, in their oppression, in warfare, in, in murder, and killing, and all the horrible things that go along with war. They say, Lord, please deliver us. But yet ultimately, not our will be done. Your will be done. Well, the end of the story comes in verse 16 with God's response. He could have, in all of his righteousness and justice, said no. But the text says he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Literally in the Hebrew, God's soul became short at the misery, the pain of Israel. Despite God's previous rejection of Israel, now he is about to move and to move mightily 
on Israel's behalf because of her repentance, because of her suffering at the hands of her enemies. And here is where we see, brothers and sisters and friends, the, the nature of God and His compassion, His gentleness, His comfort. Before His love was manifest in His chastisement or His punishment of Israel. That is a form of love, isn't it? But now we are seeing His love in the form of deliverance. And He is actually, according to the text, identifying God Himself identifying with the pain, the misery of Israel. And that may sound strange to your ears, but it is true that when we suffer, as God's children, God suffers with us. You think, that sounds a bit strange. Listen to the words of Isaiah 63.9. Isaiah 63.9 says, In all their affliction, in all Israel's affliction, He, God, was afflicted. This is a tremendous comfort in times of trial. When you suffer, God is not distant to us, the holy other God. He cares for our cares. He cares when we suffer. He cares for our tears. And the psalmist says he catches them in a bottle. When you are grieving, God grieves with you. When you sin, according to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit grieves because of that. He is intimately acquainted with all of your ways, with all of my ways. In this text tonight, we see that God was afflicted because Israel, his children, were afflicted. They are, after all, the apple of his eye, the New Old Testament says. So God will continue to be faithful to the covenant that he made with ethnic Israel here. If we read on to chapters 10 and 11, we see the prelude to war. And the next judge that's going to come and to judge Israel, Jephthah. Well, as we examine our own lives, we we understand, we identify with a lot of this story, don't we? That Israel's cycle of sin leading to repentance is really our story. Sin, hypocrisy, insincere repentance, chastening that God does with all of his children that leads us to true repentance, a brokenness, a bankruptcy before God. How are we to repent? To God? How are we to repent and confess sin to one another? These are great principles to remember and to daily remind ourselves to glorify God by being satisfied in Him and Him alone, no matter what our circumstances may be. And that we may submit to God in joyful submission, praying to Him, Lord, do to me whatever seems good to you. Let's pray for God's help in these things. Our Father, these are difficult words to read tonight as we see your firm response to the false repentance of Israel. But we realize that you do this as a loving father. And you chastise all of your children that are walking out of line, not simply just as a form of punishment, but to bring us back into relationship to yourself. And for those that don't know you, so oftentimes pain and suffering are meant to draw us to you and faith, saving faith and repentance through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and taking our sin upon himself and to die the death that we should have died, and being buried and raised three days later with the promise that all who place their faith in Him would be saved by faith alone as a gift of God. And so, Father, we thank You for these precious promises. We do thank You for affliction, because as David says, the psalmist, that if we had not been afflicted, that we would have gone astray. And so we recognize Your loving hand in these things, And so, Father, recognizing these things, we ask that you would help us to be genuine when we repent, that we would be heartbroken over our sin, that we would grieve over our sin, that we would readily confess when we sin, and not only to stop there, but make a plan how to change by replacing sinful behavior with righteous behavior. We ask that you would help us in these things so that we would bring you joy and that we would be a light to others that are living a life apart from Christ in darkness. 
We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.